what happens if this view is dangerous and so dangerous in fact that it costs people's lives and i don't say that as a what if just for a pure hypothetical it is now a fact that certain people have died as a consequence of taking joe rogan's rhetoric on mm -hmm. this question take the risk of thinking for yourself much more happiness truth beauty and wisdom will come to you that way thank you Hey everybody, Magic Skeptic here, and don't worry, the conversation is about to begin. I just wanted to make you aware here right off the bat that this is actually part two of a two-part conversation between the philosopher KNB and myself, the Magic Skeptic. Part one is an essential part of this conversation. It really serves as the foundation for part two. So if you haven't checked that out, please make sure you do. I will leave a link for that conversation in the description below. If you have indeed seen part one, I won't delay you any further. And so without further ado, I give you for the second time, K and B. Let's get on to the news that has been kind of bubbling all around the world it seems on, on this topic of late and that is the, the joe rogan podcast so i don't want to refer to the um to the virus by name because again i want this video to actually be seen it this video ceases to be relevant if nobody sees it and so for the purpose of this video i will be referring to said virus as the c flu um uh c for charlie right because um can i ask just briefly what are youtube's policies on attempting to avoid um you know the uh like and attempting to get around the rules in that kind of way because <laughs> they they're, they're like rules are pretty broad when i last looked at you know the sort of speech codes like is, yeah. is this in itself a violation of those codes <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe. So maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot here, Kane. You might be. You might be onto something here. Uh, what I found is that the algorithm is very sensitive to certain words and phrases. Yeah. Okay. And I think we could all pretty much write a list of what those words and phrases would be, and we'd all have the same more or less top ten. Um, and so it's very sensitive around those phrases. If you pass the algorithmic check, uh, you're golden. Uh, okay. you can then just proceed but if you don't pass the algorithmic check and a human reviewer looks at your video i don't know if this has happened to you yet but i've had it where a human reviewer looks at my video and passes it um, i've had it where a human reviewer looks at it doesn't pass it so i ripped it down i change a couple of things maybe bleep out a few course words re-upload it and it passes the second time uh, it's important to to get monetized because one of my goals with this channel is to achieve some kind of financial liberation in the future. If that takes 10 years, if it takes 20 years, fine. Uh, if that never happens, fine. I'm just here for the conversation primarily. But uh, if I'm going to achieve that side goal of potentially making this a source of income in the future, I do need my videos to be monetized <laughs> as much as possible. Have you had to dance with the monetization dragon, my friend? Um, no, because I, I don't I haven't monetized them. Um... Oh, have you not? Which maybe I should. <laughs> so. No, you definitely should. You definitely should, Ken. But the number of subscribers you have and the, the frequency of the viewership that you have, you would definitely make a few quid. I mean, I, don't, I can't possibly say what it would be, uh, but you'd make a few quid. Um, and a few extra quid in your pocket wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, that would be lovely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely monetize, man. You should absolutely do it. I can't believe you haven't monetized. I didn't realize that. I don't know. I just, yeah, I just didn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, we don't need to, to focus on it or anything, but yeah, it, it would be a good idea. Um, in any case, we get to Joe Rogan, uh, which I think the Joe Rogan topic is particularly relevant here um, because Joe Rogan has been embroiled in free speech controversy ever since he signed his Spotify deal for an alleged $100 million. Good for him. Can I just say before we go any further, I really, um, I'm really not sure what I think on what we're about to talk about. I, I'm, I'm undecided on some things, more certain on others, and you will see my uncertainty express itself. 
I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan on the MMA front. I'm a big fan of MMA. I love watching MMA. I think Joe Rogan's a wonderful commentator. I like Joe Rogan as a comedian. I even like him as a podcast interviewer. But I think he has been irresponsible with his platform. Mm-hmm. And yet I would still defend his right to use it the way he is using it. So if my opinion seems splintered, dear listener, if you just attribute the principle of charity here, you should be able to understand where I'm coming from. So I'm just going to stay at my position off the bat before we dive into the Joe Rogan thing in more detail and go into Mill's defenses of free speech here. But just a short history to begin with. Joe Rogan, um, I have a timeline, actually. I have a, a, a loose timeline here, which I can put in the description. I found a, I found this uh, online. Um, the name of the website is Indie100.com. And the title of the article is, Is Joe Rogan an anti-V? You know what I'm referring to. A brief history of the controversial podcaster's comments about jabs. And so just I'll give you the briefest of briefest history. So I'm going to summarize an article that has already summarized the history. So in April 2021, in an episode of his podcast, he said, if you're a healthy person, uh, if you're a 21 year old, if you're a healthy person and you're exercising all the time and you're young and yada, 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 you eat well, then you don't need to worry about the um, the sea flu. Right. Um, the science on that, I think. Again, I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist, you know, I I must warn you. The science on that, uh, I think, I think is clear. I I don't think it was necessary for a 21 year old to get it for themselves, but more so for the benefit of others. I've continuously used the analogy of a seatbelt. You know, a seatbelt is important, not just because it might save your life, but at the very least, because a seatbelt could kill you, by the way. I mean, like a seat. My fiance's dad has um, spent a lifetime attending car crash incidents um, as a firefighter and so on. And the amount of time seatbelts killed people is just horrendous to think about. But people wear them badly, and things can go wrong. But in any case, I uh, my analogy for the the jab is that it's kind of like a seatbelt. When you crash a car, if you're not wearing a seatbelt, you become a human projectile. You go through the bloody windscreen and you kill the people in the other car. Um, And so I think a seatbelt is as much about protecting the lives of others as it is in terms of protecting yourself. Uh, But here, Joe Rogan was recommending essentially that, and he's not an epidemiologist or a virologist either. And now you might say, oh, but he's not an epidemiologist or a virologist or anything, and neither are you magic skeptics, so why should we trust you over him? I'll tell you why, because the vast majority of the experts on this topic agree with me. Uh, I know people might say that's fallacious. Is that a fallacy of consensus? Is it a fallacy of authority? You can make all those claims. I'm just making a purely inductive point. I don't know if you'll agree with this, Kane, but I think you're in good you know, stead if you align your understanding about complex subject matter with (coughs) experts in the field. Is that not a totally fair inductive point? Who's more likely to be right, Joe Rogan or an epidemiologist? And I'm sorry, but I have to go with the epidemiologist there. What do you think about that thus far? Yeah, I I think that there's no alternative really to um, uh, deferring, let's say, deferring some of your opinions to people that you recognise as experts. And yep. then the question just becomes, well, which experts do we choose? I say there's no alternative because, you know, societies are just so sort of complex and there are so many things, even in our everyday lives, that we don't have even the time to, like, learn how to, you know, work with. Like, you know, if something goes wrong with, um, you know, the plumbing, right? Well, yep. I'm, like, I don't know how to fix that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get an expert that I uh, hope I can trust. Um and I think that that's just sort of inevitable, especially when it comes to topics in in like the sciences and epidemiology. There are people that spend like their whole lifetimes studying this topic who would probably admit that actually there's a lot of areas there that they, they, they themselves don't understand. I mean, as a philosopher, OK, I've spent years and years studying this. There's whole areas of philosophy that I don't understand. So I have to defer, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a nice phrase. I don't know who came up with it, but it's uh, division of cognitive labor. Um, yeah, that's it, great. I like yeah. it. That's fantastic. And, it, and it, it seems to be inevitable, right? So uh, it's necessary. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely necessary. And to answer your question, it, it just then becomes a question of which experts do we trust? Well, I would go with the consensus. Mm. 
I would go with the consensus. And the truth is, unless you want to make a grandiose, bombastic, conspiratorial claim about a global agenda to hide the truth, <laughs> well, the vast majority of global, uh, the vast majority rather of epidemiologists and virologists and experts in the field all around the world in different countries, they agree that getting the jab was the wise thing to do, mm -hmm. even for young men, even for young men with good diets, that that was the wise thing to do. Now, call me naive, <laughs> but I throw my lot in with the experts in the field, the vast majority of whom said that it was wise for me, a 30 year old, albeit I'm an asthmatic as well. So I had an extra incentive to get vaccinated. I'm triple jabbed, my friend. Um, but uh, in any case, yeah. Um, I think what Joe Rogan said there was bad information. I think the recommendation he gave was a bad one. Uh, I think that was a bad idea. But again, just giving you a quick timeline. In October 2021, <coughs> said um, that he tried to get the jab in Las Vegas, uh, but missed the opportunity because of scheduling conflicts. But he added that he believed he would be better to actually get the sea flu itself. Now, again, I can only appeal to the experts in the field, all of whom said getting the sea flu without having been immunized was a terrible idea that this <laughs> this is something that really made me sick here in the UK. I'm sure you'll remember this, Kane. But at a certain point, the conservative government's rhetoric was that we're going for herd immunity. Do you remember <laughs> that? Which r loosely translated uh, means we're going to allow X amount of you to die. Because that's what that is. Herd immunity is just exposing an unprotected population to a particular, um, you know, contagion, basically. And it's going to rip through the population and it'll kill who it kills and those who survive will have herd immunity. That's what herd immunity is. Have I missed something there? Um, I I think that that does. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. That's <laughs> but, uh, so, that's what I mean, it involved. And here, <clears throat> you know, Rogan was saying, yeah, you know, I mean, I, think, I, mean, I suppose I, I, I think just, I'll just take I, my chances, you know. Uh, well, so, so, so to be to be fair, I, I mean, you know, just so we're sort of you know, representing all, all, the, all you know, the positions fairly. Please, please do. Think, Let's steal, steal think, man know, it for me, Ken. Steal you know, man it. Well, you know, it's like, look, any any policy that, that you have, I mean, in any context is going to result in a certain amount of deaths. Um, so, you know, you can you can look at things like, you know, the speed limit, right? Um, yep. Well, we could save a lot of people if we reduce the speed limit to 40 miles an hour everywhere, like even on motorways. Okay, 40 yep. miles an hour save a lot of lives. But, you know, we decide that the sort of benefits, the ability to get to places quickly and, you know, the way that that, that helps the economy and so on, yes. it's worth it. Um, so, you know, I mean, there is a point to be made where it's like, well, like, you know, you do have to weigh the deaths against costs of locking down and so on. I mean, that's not in itself um, that's not just in itself like uh, a, a, a bad way of thinking, because sure. otherwise, you know, otherwise we'd be locking down every time there's a you know flu season, right? So, <laughs> exactly. Um, on, on, I think we can sort of say, you know, on the one side, there's like uh, black death. You know, if 50% of the population were being killed by this, then you know you're going to have to lock down. And yes. on the other side, there's flu, where it's like, well, you know what? We just do, we just do let flu sort of run through kill, the population kill, kill the old or what have you the, the most vulnerable in society no i agree with you it, it is a question of degrees it is a question of degrees i yeah. agree with you entirely <coughs> kane I, I think that's really really smart but that doesn't change the underlying facts because what you're talking about there I, I think we're we're equivocating on two very distinct things one is what are the epidemiological facts and the virological facts on the ground and the other is what should the policy be? Yeah, because you're quite right. The policy could be quite extreme. If we wanted zero people to die, the policy could be that you just stay in your houses for the next 10 years. <laughs> right now, that would be an extreme policy. And, you know, that might actually result in some deaths from suicidality and all other ma manner of things that can go wrong from um, uh, a, so a society that's locked indoors for too long. So I agree with you, but that that is policy. What I'm really addressing here is rogan's claims that you know if you're 21 <coughs> young fit and healthy you're fine yeah because that's that wasn't necessarily true 
Um, because the bit that he's missing there is even if he is correct that you will be fine, which he isn't, because there were young people who died, albeit they were in vanishingly small numbers, but there were young people who died. But there is also just the the selfless side of this, where you weren't doing it necessarily for you, you were doing it because all of the data from around the globe demonstrated that your infectiousness was reduced by being immunized. Yeah. And so you were less of a danger to those around you. Uh, now, look, that science is changing and updating and, you know, maybe I've made all these claims here and maybe they'll be shown to be false. But if they're shown to be false, they'll be shown to be false by more science. They won't be shown to be false by some comedian on a podcast. <laughs> Science gets replaced by better science. That's what science does. These, you know, conspiracy theorists who think, you know, they make, they, they say something outrageous like, oh, um, I, I don't know, um, masks don't work, right? Now, my understanding is that the science has developed on that and it turns out that they weren't as effective as we thought they were, right? That's my current understanding. If I'm mistaken about that and somebody wants to jump into the comments below, they can correct me. Cool. I'm happy to be corrected. But let's just go through this even just as a hypothetical. You have your um, conspiracy theorist who's saying, oh, don't bother wearing masks. It's all just about leftist authoritarian control. They're just trying to control you, control, control, right? They're trying to uh, condition you so that they can introduce more extreme measures later, right? Um, then the science slowly but surely discovers, you know what, we actually didn't need masks. Masks weren't as effective as we thought they were. And then the conspiracy theorist says, see, I was right all along. No, you weren't. You were incidentally correct. You know, you might you could have flipped a coin and ended up on the right answer because you didn't get to the right answer in that masks weren't useful through any kind of uh, rigorous uh, epistemological analysis of the data and scientific testing and double blind trials and all the rest of it. You just had an ignorant view that just ended up coincidentally coalescing with what was discovered later. Do you, do you see what I'm saying, Kane? And, and that's kind of what I'm addressing here. I feel like there are things that Rogan <laughs> has said that were just flat out wrong. And I feel there are other things that he said which maybe he was vindicated in the end, but that doesn't mean that he was rigorous and scientific in his understanding at the time. It still doesn't mean that we should be trusting him as a source of information. And, and that's kind of where I'm going with this. But again, we'll get to the free speech side of this in a moment. I'll just give you one more element on the timeline, unless you have something to add before I proceed there, Ken. Do you have anything to add there? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um... Coolio. I think I agree. So in December 2021, this was one crescendo of the entire thing. Uh, Rogan hosted uh, Dr. Peter uh, McCullough on his podcast, who is known <laughs> for pushing debunked and misleading claims about the C flu and um, the jab. He claimed that health officials withheld treatments for, uh, for the C flu in the early days um, uh, in order to spread fear among the population and push the public to take the jab. So again, this guy was a real conspiratorial nut that he had on. And I guess the question then becomes one of platforming. And so, look, there's more I could give you in the timeline because there's been more since he's had other um, so-called conspiratorial or anti-VAX types on. Malone, I think, was the name of another one who he's had on in the meantime. Um, so... There's been a lot of, um, shall we say, anti-scientific uh, information coming out of the Joe Rogan podcast. And so my view is that I believe in free speech. And so I stand up for Joe Rogan's right to, to say these things and to have these people on. Um, but I still think he's irresponsible for doing so. Do you think there's I'm suffering from a cognitive dissonance here, Kane, or do you agree with that? Would would you silence him here? What's your take? I, I think I think I agree with your stance on it. Um, you know, I. I always sort of try to, you know, I'm just trying to kind of imagine the, the, the sort of opposition saying, well, you know, you can you can sort of sit there and say that you think he's being irresponsible. But if you're not going to do anything about it, then like, you know. Who cares, right? Who cares what you think if you don't think that, you know? But no, I, I mean, actually, I, I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be trying to. Well, 
I don't know, because there's many, as we've discussed, there's many different ways of silencing people, right? I mean, if I'm encouraging people not to listen to Joe Rogan, um, you know, you might argue that that's contributing to an environment where those ideas are less able to be expressed. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a good point. It's it's kind of hard to to sort of weigh these things. Um, Why I don't, don't we think? Sorry, that, go ahead. I, I, so, OK, I don't think that as far as I'm aware, and again, I don't watch a, really anything of Joe Rogan, so I, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think that Rogan has said anything that would sort of go far enough <clears throat> for me to really have a a serious problem where it's like, OK, you know, we need to start looking for, you know, ways of um, of shutting this down. I think that I think I think that what Rogan has been expressing seems like it's at the level where we can respond to it by just getting out the truth. Right. And so does that make sense? No, I, uh, I, I do. You know what? <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, I don't watch much of Joe Rogan anymore either. Um, I used to watch it a hell of a lot more. Uh, partly the reason I, I, it's not that I have some agenda or something. I just don't have time. Yeah, because uh, he produces dozens and dozens of hours of podcast footage a week. And I just I just don't have time. There was a point in my life where I had more disposable time when I wasn't working full time and such. But I just don't have time between my own channel, my own full time job as a teacher and uh, podcasts like these and so on. I just don't have the time to go down the rabbit hole. Let's just examine where where we agree then, because. I think what I detected in your um, response there is that we both agree that we wouldn't support any legal sanction to have him silenced by yeah, absolutely authoritarian not. government. So we're agreed on that. We wouldn't silence him legally, right? Yeah. I would, however, encourage people. I'm going to do exactly what you said in your second comment, which is I'm going to encourage all of my listeners right now. If you want to know about the sea flu, do not go to the Joe Rogan podcast to get your information. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. Go to the relevant experts in the field, the epidemiologists and the virologists who have been studying this for decades. Read the data, read the peer reviewed papers. Don't get your quote unquote research from a Facebook article. Don't get it from a comedian uh, um, on a podcast, Joe Rogan, right? That's a bad idea. Podcasts are supposed to be about entertainment, it seems to me. It's like, you know, it's one of my pet peeves when people get angry about historical inaccuracies in films. Mm -hmm. yeah. They say, oh, that's not a very accurate film. That's not how it happened. I know because I, I wrote the book or, or, you know, I've studied the history. I have a PhD in history and I know that's not how it went. I don't care. I didn't watch the film so that I could get a documentary knowledge mm -hmm. of the thing. I watched the film to be entertained. And I think so long as you watch the Joe Rogan podcast with the simple desire of being entertained, I think that's fine. But if you're going to be watching it to get your actual health recommendations about what you should do vis-a-vis -vis the C flu, I think you're you're really, really in a you're you're putting yourself in a precarious situation. <laughs> would, would you agree with yeah. that, Ken? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Um and I mean, don't don't listen to us either. Uh, oh, which oh, makes oh, yeah, advice. absolutely. And <laughs> the only thing I'm telling you to do is, is, in fact, is to go and look, listen to the experts. Yeah. Let me reiterate, I'm not an expert in the medical fields. I, I'm not even an amateur in the medical field. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I know nothing about medicine and I, I don't think you do either, Kane. No. Last I checked, uh, Ph.D. students in the philosophy of science don't do surgery and epidemiology on the side, right? No. And so, yeah, don't trust us at all. All I would urge you to do is to go consult the relevant experts in the field, right? And so with all that acknowledged, despite how, you know, maybe strange my point of view, and Kane, you evidently agree with it, this idea that we, if, if you'll be comfortable with me using the pronoun we can, we agree, and if you if I misrepresent your view at all here, just interject, but we seem to agree tentatively, tentatively at least, that while Rogan has been arguably irresponsible with his platform by platforming these so-called dangerous ideas, ideas that could lead someone in the direction of not getting jabbed and then potentially dying, Right. While it's irresponsible to platform ideas like that, we wouldn't agree with any legal sanction against his platform. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that fair so far? Yeah. 
Okie dokie. So this might be a good time then, Kane, for you to take the floor here. And if you could elucidate on John Stuart Mill's arguments in favour of free speech. So just to give a little bit of a, 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 a track here for the listener who's wondering where this conversation is going. What I would like to do um, to bring this conversation to a close is for Kane to go through the classical Mill arguments for free speech. And then after you have outlined those arguments, Kane, I would like to reiterate them with respect to the Joe Rogan podcast. And let's see how Mill's arguments interface with the Joe Rogan podcast and what he's been saying about the sea flu and whether or not Mill, if we can approximate um, in his absence, whether or not Mill would have actually agreed with the continued free speech of one Joe Rogan. Does that sound fair enough? Okay. Yeah. So, do you want to take take it away, my friend? Uh, All right. Well, um, I'm not sure how you want to do this. I mean, there's uh, it, it it might take you know a little because okay. So Mill Mill raises. Uh, I mean, depending on how you interpret him, it's it's sort of maybe three or maybe five separate arguments. But uh, yeah. Um. You know, there's a few different ways, I suppose, of of interpreting the the text. But anyway. Um. So yeah. Uh. This is in the book on liberty that's where these arguments occur um so okay the first one right sure um so one point that mill makes is whenever you silence an opinion um the opinion may well be true uh so nobody's infallible uh we all sort of rely on our interactions with other people um at least in some ways, in order to help us find the truth. Uh, if you suppress an opinion, then you suppress the ability of all other people to judge that opinion. You are sort of depriving yourself not only of that opinion, but of the expertise that other people might bring with respect to that opinion, because you prevent them from from hearing it. Um, so one one concern that Mill has is that censorship sort of assumes a kind of infallibility on yes. part of the census um because you know like well may maybe maybe this uh the the anti v position which it occurs to me as i'm saying this when we're talking about joe rogan uh anybody who's jumping onto the video here might think we mean anti-vegan or something like that but no no we don't <laughs> uh when yeah. we're when we're saying anti-v guys anti -V. We're talking yeah. about the VAX. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, maybe the anti-V position is is right. So this this sort of argument, I mean, like I don't think this is particularly convincing in in this context. Um, I think I couldn't that, agree more. Yeah. So, I so like <laughs> you know when when we're talking about um, debates concerning you know religion or like general political opinions, you know, should you be a socialist? Should you be a conservative? Right. Um, yeah, you can kind of see that this argument might be right, right? Like, it seems like in those contexts, we maybe should have a bit more doubt. When it comes to something like a, a vaccine... Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> when it comes to that kind of thing, um, I'll try to avoid that. Just, right, when it comes to that kind of thing, um, again, these have been, like, very well-tested, uh, you know... Yes. Uh, and I, I mean, it's not just this one. It's not like this is a recent. Uh, there, there have been recent technologies involved in the specific v. C flu Vs, right? <laughs> yeah. um, more, more, more recent technologies. But like, you can look at the sort of history of how we test these things, and you can look at the, uh, I mean, almost universal consensus among the experts in as I mean, as you point out, right, these are experts in a bunch of different fields all over different countries, like some of them, you know, work for universities, some of them work for the governments. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different institutions that pretty much universally agree this is safe. Um, and effective. So, yeah, um, yeah. So like, you know, this this point about, well, maybe we're wrong. Yeah, may maybe we are wrong. But then you can kind of say that about anything, right? I mean, you could similarly yes. say, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. You could say, well, well, maybe maybe we're wrong about, you know, like dumping toxic waste into rivers. Uh, maybe that's actually a good thing. Maybe it, it helps. <laughs> promote it, right? You could be wrong about that. <laughs> maybe shooting yourself in the head is good for your health. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do you know what? Let's do it this way, because I was going to get you to recount all of Mill's arguments and then go yeah. back with Joe, with a view to Joe Rogan. But let's just do it as we go, because yeah. this is the over and back here is wonderful. So I've written a note here. So, yes, Mill's first argument is there's always the chance <coughs> that the suppressed opinion is correct. Uh, people know very little and nobody is infallible. Mm -hmm. You used the example in a video you met on the subject um, that if the claim grass is green can be potentially incorrect, then so could anything, right? Um, mm. And that's true, right? What we've discovered about color and how our eyes interact with our environment, is grass really green or is that just a reflection of the spectrum and how our eye interfaces with reality? And um, yeah, there's, there's interesting thoughts there, but as you just pointed out, Cain, when it comes to empirical hard science, and V's, right, for something like the sea flu, it's pretty difficult to establish any wriggle room there, right? It's pretty difficult to establish, oh, well, maybe this is just all false. Um, maybe this is all nonsense, despite the fact that it has been independently verified and repeated and falsified on a global scale. And has achieved you know remarkable success and the data again is very clear in this um these v's have been incredibly successful all around the world and so my question with respect to joe rogan when it comes to mill's first defense of free speech is you know he says maybe the suppressed opinion could be correct my first thought is well aren't opinions irrelevant when it comes to factual matters in factual domains what matters is facts not opinions um, isn't it just a fact that V's work? And so what do you think, do you think this means that maybe when it comes to the special case of Joe Rogan, that we could actually be discovering here, at least with respect to Mill's first argument, that maybe Joe Rogan doesn't pass this test. Maybe this can't be used as a defense for his rhetoric because you can't establish any wriggle room about how he might be right. <laughs> How do, how do you feel about that, Kim? Because I like I think so, this is this is very important to get to the bottom of, wouldn't you say? I think that we probably can establish wiggle room. Um, okay. And but the thing is that it's the relevance of that is is not so clear to me. Uh, so here's a simple way to establish wiggle room. Um, maybe uh, maybe the external world is just an illusion, right? Um, <laughs> maybe maybe this is all just a dream. Maybe I'm a brain in a vat. Um, well, then, you know, I, I don't know anything about like how effective these are. Um, I don't think that those arguments are particularly easy to refute, uh, as it turns out. Some philosophers will say that it is very easy to refute that kind of radical scepticism. I don't think it is. So, OK, you've got room you pretty way. much any I, empirical claim you like. Um, I agree. But with I, you. I, I think the point. So for me, it's more like, all right, well, Here's the thing, right? Let's say we accept that, and it, this seems to be again pretty obviously true uh, that like speech can have consequences. Uh, let's say that you know when I speak, that can influence people. That I mean, I, I mean, if it wasn't doing that, what would be the point uh, of of speaking? Yes. You know. So, um, okay. In, in a sense, then a speech is just you know one among many actions that I can take that can influence the world in a particular way, and we are all quite happy with. Um, states or at least communities uh, uh, having particular rules that restrict the actions people can take. Um, you know, like, for example, I can't just go out and punch someone in the face. Now, it's always possible to say, well, maybe you're mistaken about what the consequences of that will be. Um, maybe this time when I punch someone in the face, it will produce lots of pleasure and they'll really like it. And that's exactly what they want me to do. <laughs> Maybe they're a masochist. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it, like it, se it seems that this point about infallibility, I think <laughs> there, there are some things where maybe it's just that we sort of have to take certain things for granted. Um, and, you know, it's it's one thing to sort of engage in in kind of philosophical scepticism. Uh, but it, it, ultimately, we have to 
come to some decision on what the rules should be for organising society. Um, does it assume infallibility whenever we have a rule? Well, not necessarily, because we can always revisit the rules. Um, so we could say, you know, OK, let's uh, let's sort of censor. The sort of things that Joe Rogan was expressing, but are we assuming infallibility when we do that? I mean. Maybe we could just say, well, look, you know, there's still research going on. If the research comes out that there's actually something to this, then, you know, we'll stop censoring it. Um, so. Yeah, I think that this particular argument, there's a, there's, there's a lot of ways of um, of kind of responding to that. Uh, so you're saying that it could actually be a defensible position to censor Joe Rogan? Well, if the only argument against it is is this one, right? Is this is this point sure. about, um, well, maybe the uh, the suppressed opinion is true. Um, so I, am I detecting in you then, Kane, that by the time we've gotten to the gotten through all of Middle's arguments, do you think Joe Rogan's speech is going to be vindicated in the sense that it should stand a la the kind of principle of free speech and Mill's defense of it? Are you saying that this maybe first argument isn't the best to defend Rogan's particular <laughs> rhetoric, but that the other arguments are maybe going to do a better job of defending his particular rhetoric is is that what you're hinting at perhaps i think in general the other you know the other arguments are more compelling um okay. whether they end up defending rogan i again i'm i'm not entirely sure there's there's you know there's a lot of ways of responding to mill um sure. on this point right so yeah i i i'm i'm not sure how powerful his cumulative case is but i i suppose we'll you know just have to talk through it let's, and see. let's find out let's find out why <laughs> let's proceed ken why don't you um why don't you tell us what Mill's second uh, second defense is? Please, OK, so please the second right point in. is that um, whenever somebody, the, the suppressed opinion, even if it's not true, right, even if it's false, um, it may contain some some portion of the truth. Uh, so the expression of incorrect ideas may well uh, highlight certain important things that we have missed. Um, it may well be that okay, it's it's false, but it's 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 somehow kind of pointing to something that is accurate that we haven't yet realised. And like, if you suppress, so if you suppress people, you deprive yourself of that, right? So um, it doesn't need to be the case that it's just true that um, you know uh, people who are twenty one, you know wouldn't benefit or or like you know whatever or, or that, that doesn't you know you don't you don't need to assume that he is correct but it, it may be that um there's there's something right that there's there's something correct in what he's saying um because in general you know like uh it's rarely the case that we would judge an a, 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 a belief to be either just completely true or completely false sure um, and i mean to yeah. be fair to rogan because uh, we haven't, you know, stated all of his claims here. To be fair to Rogan, he was massively concerned with lockdowns and um, the psychological impact that they were going to have on people. And I think he was right on all of it. Did plummet. I'm a secondary school teacher, as you know, Kane, and I tell you, it takes a lot for secondary school students to be happy to be in school as I'm sure you can appreciate. And after lockdown ended and we all went back to school, I, for the first time in my career, had willing, enthusiastic students in front of me, like super happy to be in school, super enthusiastically and enormously happy because they had been deprived of it for two years, basically, or a year, a year and a half at least. Um, Deprived of the socialization of school, deprived of lessons, deprived of learning, uh, deprived of even just the general banter with teachers. And, you know, I have good relationships with my students. I'm a very amicable person and I get on very well with 99.9% .9 of people I encounter, basically. Um, and so, yeah, um, it is fair to say that there are kernels of truth in what Joe Rogan was bringing to light about um, the... Uh, the lockdown with relation to the sea flu and so on mm -hmm. and so yeah i mean i just i i like you said earlier kane i don't ever want to be perceived as being biased i know we're all biased 
to a fault anyway. We can't ever truly escape our biases, but at least I want to try my best to steal Manny's position. And so there were things, with the greatest of respect, uh, there were things he was right about. So perhaps this second defensive mill does quite accurately apply to Rogan, that, you know, he did have some truth in his corner. Yeah, so I think that um, this point, the second point, there's kind of two ways of interpreting it, because you can apply it to a specific claim, right? Or you might apply it to, like, the person's platform in general. Now, when you apply it to, like, the person's platform in general, I think it's pretty, pretty plausible. Um, so the kind of people who are more on the uh, anti-V side, um, I mean, this is just a, a, another sort of example, right? So you gave the example that, well, you know, maybe they were expressing scepticism of certain policies like lockdowns, and maybe they were pointing to um, kind of pr problems, right, with those policies that other that people might have missed and that we might not have been taking into proper consideration. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, there's, there's that point. Um, another example of this, and I, I'm not sure what the status of this idea is, but I remember um, quite early on in, in the, uh, um, the whole sea flu fiasco, um, <laughs> there was people proposing this, uh, hypothesis that it leaked out of, um, out of a lab, right? Great, great and of course example. It was, great example. That's just crazy. You know, that's just yes. stupid conspiracy theory. Uh, like, you know, this is just not something that we can, that we should take seriously at all. I think Trump suggested it at once. So it's just like, yeah, that's yeah. completely nuts. Like QAnon. And then, yeah. you know, I don't know if, I mean, I, it hasn't been proven, but like the sort of the it's epistemic state of that. It's, yeah, it's now yeah. been taken very seriously, suffice to say. Right. It, that's my understanding, right, is that the last yeah. time I looked into this is that, yeah, I mean, it looks like we're more on the sort of maybe a bit closer to like 50-50. Maybe. Yeah. It, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> this is kind of an important thing because th there was a case of, um, I, I, I can't remember the guy's name. Right. So this sort of connects to our point about about, well, we can just trust experts. I think we should trust experts. Let me let me say that. Right. As a general stance. But they but, can. They can. We can't just take it as a sacrosanct position no. that the and, experts are always right, because that would be fallacious. They're right. not correct because they're experts. They're correct only if they've got the consensus of the evidence to support the position that they have an expertise on. Um, it's 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 deeper. Right. And so. Yeah, you, you, have you remembered the name? Is this an expert who was who was wrong on something? Is that oh, it's point? not. No, it's worse than that. Um, oh dear. So oh, oh goodness. I can't remember the name, which is frustrating. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll have to look this up afterwards. Um, when this lab lab leak theory was going around in in the early stages, I think it was the Lancet put out a a, a kind of response to it, right? Like shutting this down. Yeah. But that response, you know, was signed by like a hundred scientists. It was written by a man who had a financial interest uh, or financial connections to the oh Wuhan Institute of Virology, right? So the problem is, is that, you know, yes, we, we certainly, like as a general stance, you know, we have no choice but to defer our beliefs to, um, to experts. But the simple fact is, is that like scientific fraud does happen. And, yes. you know, scientists are only human. And like, so it, it, like even if, you know, I mean, even even if you were to think that scientific fraud doesn't happen, sometimes they just make mistakes. Um, but it does happen. And, you know, there might be something to be said for, like, allowing platforms that sort of allow the expression of ideas that we might otherwise think are, are kind of dangerous or, or just obviously wrong. Because, you know, maybe, you know, people get caught in echo chambers. And very often, you know, when you get committed to one sort of position, being in an echo chamber like commits you to a whole load of other positions. So it's like I like yes. to see myself as, you know, kind of rational. I'm I'm rational. I'm skeptical. So I don't buy into these crazy conspiracy theories. Or maybe I see myself as a left 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 wing person. So, you know, I hate Donald Trump. And when Trump says stuff about, you know, lab leaks, I think, again, you know, I'm, I'm opposed to that. It can be easy to sort of get caught in these tribalism of belief. Yeah. Tri tribalism. Tribalism. Right. That's, that's exactly what it is. And so one of the dangers of shutting down platforms that are expressing things that we think are false, the things that we think are dangerous is, you know, like, yeah, they might be right about some stuff. And maybe 
maybe it's important to have those opinions put out there or sure. so that they can be you know evaluated no i think you raised some great points yeah. um I, I think you raised some great points one thing i do feel that is absolutely essential that i mention in response is that when such scientific frauds do occur they are often corrected by more science Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just really important to remember because one of the things I feel I really want to push back against on my channel and in this conversation specifically because this conversation is, you know, right on the kind of coattails of this entire phenomenon. But we, we tend people call our society a post truth society. And I think I know what they I think I know what people mean when they say that we're living in a society where trust in our uh, political and scientific institutions uh, that trust is eroding it's breaking down we live in a society where people talk about my truth mm. and you know there is no my truth as far as i can tell there is if you want to you know equivocate on the meaning of the word truth and you want to talk about you know emotional well-being or yeah there's your experience and my experience yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah your psychological state versus my psychological state etc cetera, etc cetera. but if we're talking about truth and truth means empirical scientific fact there is no my truth there is water doesn't boil at the temperature that i want it to it has nothing to do with my desires it's completely independent of my experience or my lived experience or my truth there's just the fact of the matter and then i'm either right or wrong with respect to it but uh, people's respect for scientific institutions because of scientific fraud there have been frauds that have occurred that you know like you just said right so scientists saying that oh no leaking from a laboratory that's a nonsense there's no way and then suddenly that's become the preponderant kind of theory of of the time right so yesterday's conspiracy can become tomorrow's potential truth right that said we have to be extremely careful about the lesson we learn from that narrative don't we because that risks engaging in the currency of the post-truth paradigm that we appear to be living in where people don't trust doctors and epidemiologists and virologists where people get on facebook and social media and they doubt the word of experts in the field in favor of an article that they read while they were sitting on the bog in KFC, you know? Yeah. And, and I just think, first of all, the arrogance of that is beyond belief. Um, the truth is, the reason many scientists doubted the laboratory leak hypothesis in the beginning is because there was no evidence for it in the beginning. When the evidence mounted, they then slowly but surely began to take it more seriously. That's what good science should do. You're supposed to follow the evidence where it leads. You know, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the best anybody can do, it seems to me. And so, again, I just want to put in a defense for science because I don't want anybody coming away from this conversation with the impression that I'm recommending that we distrust the science. I think all we can do, as you pointed out so articulately, Kane, because we're not uh, infallible. We 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 can't know everything, and so we have no choice but to defer to experts. What else are you going to do? I saw a wonderful meme. I'll finish on this, and then you can respond, Kane. But I saw a wonderful meme of Joe Rogan doing. He's kind of like he's thinking, and his eyebrow is raised, and the wording is um, nine out of ten dentists claim that flossing is essential for good dental hygiene, but that tenth scientist that that tenth dentist must be onto something. <laughs> and then he invites the tenth dentist onto the yeah. podcast, right? And I really feel like, I know that's a satire and that's an unfair straw man of what's going on. Please don't think, dear listener, that I'm, you know, just sidelining Joe Rogan in that way. But I think there is a kernel of wisdom in that claim in terms of the post-truth society that we appear to be living in. People don't want to trust the nine out of ten dentists or the nine out of ten scientists. They want to go with what the one guy is saying on a comedian's podcast who doesn't have the support of any peer review or serious evidential backing or data to go with the claims that they're making. And I just feel like our society is broken if that's where we are. What say you? I think that you've kind of, yeah, like sort of pointed to a, a problem, I guess, with this, with the defense um, based on, you know, the idea that there's a portion of truth, which is, well, yeah, even if you think there is a grain of truth, um, maybe there are better ways of finding it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like it, not on a comedian's podcast it example. really isn't it really isn't <laughs> obvious that um 
like, okay, so the conspiracy people were perhaps they were onto something with the lab leak thing, but um, that, like, I guess this is a point we you mentioned earlier where it's sort of accidental, right? Like, um, it's like flipping a coin. Um, yeah. So you know, even if people came to believe that, it, like, is is that did they have a justified belief in that? Well, probably not. Yeah. I mean, I suppose. Um, you know, one thing to say here is, well, look, any institution um, kind of has the potential to become to become dogmatic. Right. And it, it may be the case that like, OK, at the moment, right, we have sort of scientific institutions that operate through kind of peer review and they you know, allow a sort of uh, very free expression of ideas. Um, there may be some danger in in just sort of saying, well, like, let's just trust it completely uncritically. Um, okay. Perhaps part of what sustain, perhaps part of what makes these institutions reliable is the fact that they exist in a society where, you know, there is free expression and people can, people can oppose them, right? Um, because if you didn't have that, well, you know, what, what would they look like? Um, I mean, it's not it's not like just anything that has the label of science is thereby reliable. Uh, sure. You know, look at sort of, you know, in the Soviet Union, you know, had Lysenkoism. Well, again, you know, that was a, a, a thoroughly unfree society where opinion was suppressed. But he was a scientist. Right. Yeah. And the Lysenkoists were scientists. Um, so, I yeah, say, I, I think it's sorry, oh, sorry. Finish your thought. No, no, no. Go ahead, Ken. Finish your thought. No, I, I, I'm just saying, you know, I, I think I pretty much was finished. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. I think it um, is, it is. Applies. And, and you know, I, I think we're more or less on the same page here. Um, one thing I will say is that yes, there are scientists who can get things remarkably wrong, but then my very first question is, but are they doing science when they're wrong? Because when I say science, when I use that label, I'm not just saying. I'm not just referring to people with fancy letters in front of their mm -hmm. names. I'm referring so, science is a process. I think it's best understood as a process. It's a method. Yeah. It is the it is the a method whereby we based on observations form hypotheses, create experiments to test those hypotheses in order to falsify the hypothesis and see if it graduates through rigorous falsification and independent falsification by people all over the world to see if such hypotheses graduate to become theories, which is the highest possible cadence point of any idea. That system isn't perfect and we can get things wrong, but when we get things wrong, we only figure out that those things were wrong with reference back to that method. At no point in history has a scientific explanation been swapped out for a religious one. It all goes in the opposite direction. This is just one analogy. It, as far as I'm aware, and maybe you'll enlighten me here, but as far as I'm aware, every single possible religious explanation in the past that has um, changed, has changed and given way as a consequence of science. There is no scientific explanation that has given way to make room for a religious one that has, you know, beaten it. Or, or, you know, shown to be correct in lieu of the scientific one. And it's the same in other domains as well. Pseudoscience gets replaced by science. Conspiracy gets, conspiracy theory gets replaced by conspiracy fact, if indeed there's evidence to support the conspiracy. But on the note of conspiracies, conspiracies generally don't lead to the truth. It's not to say that there's never been a conspiracy that, was revealed to be true. My favorite example is the Reichstag fire in, in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. which Hitler famously used to pass the Enabling Act, which, you know, the rest is history, right? A key moment in Hitler's rise to power, right? And so conspiracies happen. And, you know, I've had conversations with friends about this and they're like, Magic Skeptic, are you really telling me that you don't think conspiracies happen? Of, of course I think conspiracies happen, but the time to believe that a conspiracy has happened is when there's evidence to support that a conspiracy has happened. But the problem is, while the conspiracy theorist might well be vindicated when it comes to the lab leak, but like we've agreed, they will come to be vindicated not because of their rigorous <laughs> methodological scientific insights, their rigorous methodological scientific insights. 
they will be revealed to be correct merely incidentally. Conspiracy theorists were not right when they said we didn't land on the moon. They were not right when they said that the Titanic was sunk with a missile by the Russians or whatever that nonsense. They're not right about the lizard people, <laughs> right? They're not right about the flat earth. They're conspiracy theorists. They're not right about 9-11 being an inside job, right? Conspiracy theories are garbage until they're demonstrated to be true. And so when people want to start talking conspiracy theories about lab leaks and the sea flu and, you know, it's about government control and all the rest of it. And, you know, the other one, they really do have the cure for cancer, but there's more money to be made in treating it. All of these nonsense ideas, they all belong in a big black sack that should be chucked into the ocean. These ideas are nonsense, right? But I guess this is going to bring us perhaps, you know, quite, you know, conveniently back to Mill who says that by hearing these conspiracy theories, we get to test our own ideas, right? The question is, is it worth the price, Cain, right? So we're just on the second of Mill's defenses here, which is that, you know, maybe there's a portion of the truth in, in our opponent's position. Do you want to respond to what I've just said there and then segue into the third one? Yeah, okay. because I, mean... I think the third one is going to bear particular fruit here because that's, with reference to ideas that are completely false and how they can actually still have utility right. for us despite their falsity. So is there anything you want to say in response to what I've just said first, Cain? Um, um, I, right I mean, I guess this, the, I mean, I, I, you sort of raised a few, a few, quite a lot of points there. Um, so I suppose one thing... Take your time, is, please, yeah, please address to, them all, be my no, guest. No, I, I mean, some of them are kind of tangents, but I think that one thing that is worth bearing in mind in this context is that... Um, so like when we talk about, you know, the, the scientific method and so on, I mean, it, yeah, OK, right. You know, we have this method for forming beliefs. I, I think my point was that um, we also have institutions, right? Like this, this method is not done by just sort of single individuals sitting in their house. It's not like you can sit down in your house as a single individual and, um, you know, like apply this method and come up with the theories that you get in science. It takes place within institutions. And I, I think that that's where you know, you sort of get a bit of a concern about, OK, you know, the minute the minute you have that, right, the minute you have like these institutions where certain people have certain types of power in them or where they can be potentially influenced by, you know, uh, external. I mean, I gave the example of like Lysenkoism. That's, you know, sure. scientists being forced by the government. But there are, you know, more subtle examples like how, you know, for a, a long time, um, it looks like the science on diet was being influenced by, um, at least in some countries, by, uh, you know, uh, food industry. Right. So For sure. Um, sugar was promoted as a as being like a more healthy alternative to fat. Right. So the argument was, well, you know, fat is the problem. Um, and that led to. At least in some countries, massive amounts of sugar being put in food instead. Um, yeah. Because when, when you, you take the, all the fat out of food, it tastes like crap. So you have yeah. to replace it with something, <laughs> and they replace it with refined sugar. <laughs> and you know, when you like, when you look at the history of this, I mean, yeah, the people doing that were scientists, and they were performing experiments, and um, you know, they had the system of peer review and and all of that. But um, it does look like there was a lot of sort of just dogmatism there. Um, so I, I guess the point is just like when, when you have institutions. Um, you, you, it doesn't matter how good your method is. You're never you're never really going to get away from the fact that human beings are just flawed. Um, it's the best we so have, though, right? We, we yeah. must agree. Despite those flaws and those biases, it is the best we have. That, that this that's, is that's where I suppose do, right? the point about this sort of second million argument might have some force where it's saying, yeah. well, you know. In a case where like if you have a situation where there has been fraud or or there's just, you know, straight up like dogmatism or, you know, somehow the, the scientific institution has been captured by, um, you know, let's say interests that are not um, focused on getting at the truth. Um, like maybe that maybe it's important to have free expression of ideas to sort of hold them to account, as it were. Sure. sure. So that, that that I suppose might be one way to to kind of push that point. No, that's a great point. So in other words, and, and correct me if I um, if I don't capture the point correctly here. So Mill's second point is that 
in most debates, neither side is entirely correct. So we need both sides mm. um, to one extent or another. Right now, while it might be difficult to find where the kernel of truth is in Joe Rogan's <laughs> allegedly anti V uh, statements is it might be difficult to find that kernel of truth. But so long as human biases and the capacity for institutions to corrupt and corrode the scientific method exist, so long as those things are realities and they are, this second million point stands that there might actually be truth in what looks like a patently false idea, um, if only because the truth that has ascended to become known as a fact could in fact be the result of a corrupt institution which led to that truth through bias and mm -hmm. an all an all too human um kind of flawed endeavor is that kind of the the spirit of the the point you're making there ken yeah yeah cool cool so yeah. let's get on to number three then because i think this is probably where the most relevant million argument can be found. I, I don't know if you'll agree with that, but in this case, I feel like this bears particular fruit in terms <laughs> of defending Joe Rogan's speech on these matters. So be okay, my yeah, guess. So the third point, um, let's imagine that the view in question, that the view that people are trying to suppress is just false, right? And it doesn't have even a grain of truth. Well, Mill says, you know, it's like one of the important reasons for allowing the expression of these views is that the only way that you can properly understand the justification for your own views um, is through argument, right? Is through uh, kind of bringing them against alternative views and, you know, seeing how well they stack up. If you suppress an opinion, then then your then your opinion is just going to become a sort of dead dogma, as Mill says, it's just going to become a prejudice. Um, it's not going to be sort of knowledge that is held on rational grounds. Um, it, I mean, it's just going to be maybe something that's like assumed, you know, it's it's like maybe something that's felt emotionally, but you're not going to have rational grounds for it um, because, you know, you, you just won't understand the case for it. Now, obviously, you can say, well, like, couldn't you come up with arguments yourself, right? Like when I have a particular position, so I, for instance, um, uh, in favor of, uh, of of the V, let's say, right? Yeah. Well, I, I can imagine objections to it. But the thing is, is that people are just really, really bad at coming up with objections to the positions that they themselves hold. Um, yeah. It's, you know, people are just subject to things like confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. And m what Mill would say is, is that the strongest arguments against your own position come from people who sincerely hold the alternative position. Yes. Um, we're bad at seeing the flaws of our own beliefs. So it's, you know, you, you allow them to speak because that actually makes your position stronger. You know, it means that it remains a kind of a live option. It, re it remains like knowledge, not just dogma. Yeah, uh, what I've written here is essentially the, the exact same thing. So even if a view is totally false, it should be heard so that others who are correct are challenged because one cannot know the veracity of their own position unless it's challenged. Absent any challenge, one just has beliefs, not knowledge. And so one can see a very interesting defense of Joe Rogan's um, kind of ramblings on this question. So assuming he's wrong on all of his claims, you know, and the people he's platformed um, who have spouted what I would call conspiratorial nonsense about um, the sea flu and the efficacy of the V. Um, yeah, I think those claims were patently false, but perhaps it's wise for us to allow such dissenting voices, if only to challenge our own opinions, if only to challenge our own thoughts and ideas. That's it, right? That's Mill's third point. Is that yeah. a fair summary? Yeah. So my problem here, and, and this is why I'm conflicted, I mentioned in the beginning that I was conflicted, and here's why I'm conflicted, and you can probably guess what I'm going to say before I even say it. What happens, Cain, and what do you think Mill would say 
if this totally false view, despite the fact that it serves as a useful challenge for those who have the opposing view, what happens if this view is dangerous and so dangerous, in fact, that it costs people's lives? And I don't say that as a what if, just for a pure hypothetical. It is now a fact that certain people have died as a consequence of taking Joe Rogan's rhetoric on mm -hmm. this question and the rhetoric of others who have championed a similar message. Brett Weinstein comes to mind. Um, in fact, I've got a name. I've got one specific name. Uh, I could have written down more, but just I wanted to have at least one example so that people don't think I'm just pulling this uh, out of nowhere. Um, so his name was Leslie Lawrenson. He's now dead. Now, this doesn't fall squarely at the feet of Joe Rogan. He apparently shared Joe Rogan's content as well, but his real infatuation was with the work of one Brett Weinstein, who was championing a very similar message, uh, an anti-V message, where he was recommending that people avoid it, or no matter what way you cut it, he was championing a message of hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out Steve, uh, Leslie Lawrenson took this to heart, got COVID. Oh, I just said it again. Uh, I'll bleep that out. He got C. He got the C flu, and he died. And one of his uh, his several of his final posts on social media before he died were all um, posts where he was sharing the podcasts of Brett Weinstein and telling everybody how they should be listening to this and how they should be avoiding the V. So, how do you think this interfaces, Kane, when there is very real? directly traceable deaths that occur as a consequence of this rhetoric. How do you think Mill would respond to this? How do you respond to this? Do you think this is a defeater? Or do, yeah, we, so have I, to, I think, do um, we have to accept these deaths? I mean, how I does think this work? is a, a really challenging point. Um, I agree. So there's, there's a, I guess a couple of ways of pushing the challenge, right? So one is just to say, OK, um, you know, what Mill has said here, I can accept all of this, right? Like there's a value in getting my opinion and sort of putting it in the, you know, the battle in the marketplace of ideas. And yeah. that gives me rational grounds that, that that gives me better grounds for my own beliefs. But, you know, that's just one value among many. Right. Like there are lots of things that are important to us. And one of the things that's important to us is having rational justifications for our views. But then another thing that's important to us is that, you know, we live in a society that's peaceful and stable and people are healthy and intelligent, et cetera. Like we want things that promote those things. We want to promote public health. So yeah. like if, if, we, if Mill has identified something valuable here, okay, great. But if that conflicts with the goal of public health, then, you know, maybe we should uh, sacrifice the speech, right? I mean, that's not, that's not just, it's not just obvious that speech is like always, that it's always better um, to have, you know, knowledge rather than dead dogma, as as Mill says. The other way of kind of pushing this against Mill um, is that, and I mean, we haven't really mentioned this, but Mill isn't sort of, he, he's not like an absolutist on speech. Uh, in fact, sort of absolutism on speech doesn't, doesn't really make a lot of sense as a position. Um, pretty much everybody accepts some restrictions, right? Of now, course. the restrictions- Slander, that, you can't slander someone, for example. Right. I mean, that's yeah, you, uh, libel, libel and slander. You can't just lie about people and, and get away with it. That's illegal. Or uh, false advertising is, yeah. I think, uh, another another one. You know, if I if I tell people that, you know, the car has, you know, working brakes and it doesn't. It says a lot about it because my first thought was I'm going to sell you some magic beans <laughs> um, and uh, these magic beans cure all sorts of diseases uh, or you can turn them into a beanstalk. It's up to you. It follows your truth. You know, I was going to go down that road, but you uh, you went for a much more real world, uh, better example, <laughs> actually. Yeah, you can tell people that the brakes work and sell it as such and then right. have them die as a consequence of purchasing I your, I think your shoddy that's... vehicle. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. I agree. Free so, speech fundamentalism is a nonsense. I sometimes self-identify as a free speech fundamentalist, but I'm doing that 
in reaction to a paradigm yeah. that my anecdotal experience has told me is actually quite conservative when it comes to speech. I just mean that I'm fundamentalist by comparison to those that would arrest the preacher or have the woman um, have to cover up her T-shirt, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. all I mean by that. I don't mean that I'm a fundamentalist in the sense that I think all speech is permitted because clearly the examples that we've just mentioned are beyond the pale. Yeah, so um, Mill does... I mean, Mill recognizes this, and what what he says is he frames it in terms of what he calls his harm principle. And um, yes. I can't remember exactly how he phrases this, but basically, the idea is: look, the the like the only legitimate use of suppression of speech is to prevent harm. Now, the trouble with this is that harm, you know, harm is a very slippery concept. Like, <laughs> yes. What, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of harm, right? I mean, yes. you know, we we might talk about like offensive speech maybe causes psychological harm you know if you if you interpret harm in that kind of broad sense then actually um the harm principle is going to rule out a hell of a lot of speech sure. um so the way that mill understands this is that the harm has to be um physical injury or like property damage and it has to be directed against specific persons so he yeah. gives the example of you know imagine if there's like a mob outside the house of a corn dealer and um you know you were to sort of stand up in front of the mob and start encouraging you know and start saying like you know corn dealers are killing the poor um and you were to start saying things like that riling up the mob well mill would say that's not acceptable because you know you're like direct you're essentially directing them this this mob you know you're getting this mob fired up to go and kill or harm or damage the property of the corn dealer reminds me of something that happened january last year i can't quite put my finger on it but... <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a good point yeah that's yeah. exact no that's exactly the sort of thing where yeah. i think mill's harm principle would would rule that out like um yeah yeah, yeah. You know, you've got it you've got a crowd that's clearly um enraged you yeah. know they're, they're clearly fired up and then you stand up in front of them and you say the election has been stolen you know we've yeah. got to go there we've got to take it back yeah so that's a that's a that's a good example of that yeah um but then you know so but then if for for instance you were you know just writing an article in a paper where you say that you know corn dealers are killing off the poor that's fine as far as mill's concerned because yes it's not like specific it's not directed so so mill has a very narrow interpretation of what harm is but one way we can push him on this is just to say, well, you know, what's the justification for that? I mean, you know, if somebody is like if I have if there's a specific person right listening to Joe Rogan and as a result, they do not get vaccinated. Yes. And then they catch the disease and die. Right. I mean, that, that looks like they've been harmed. Um, I, agree. And, I mean, you can you can always say, well, you know, it's not as if Rogan forced them not to get the vaccine. But then no. when you stand up in front of the crowd outside the corn dealer's house, you're not forcing them to go yeah. and kill the corn dealer. Trump, Trump didn't force anybody to march on the Capitol. Right. He didn't hold a gun to anybody's head, did he? No. So exactly. if people want to if people want to be, you know, want to start playing uh, fast and loose with uh, with those arguments, they they're going to have to accept some pretty bitter pills, it would seem. Yeah. Right. Um, so there could be people on the left who will, you know, in one hand, on one hand, rather condemn Trump uh, for instigating a coup. But then. I don't know, on, on the other hand, might not apply the principle in the same way. I, I swear I had a more uh, a more solid comparison there. But if I'm understanding the point correctly, I mean. <laughs> what? What was the example you just gave, Cade, well, about force? You, you give, I, what was your example again? Because my, my brain has screwed up to two thoughts. So you give the example about force where it would be you, somebody might want to call it force in one area, but then it's not in the other. What What was the exact oh, no, example so you gave? What again? I'm saying is, is like, that, so when, you know, when, when the person stands up in front of the mob, right, they're not forcing them to do anything. Um, yes. So yes. I, I said, like, you know, well, you know, it's, you can always say, well, you know, Joe Rogan didn't force anyone not to get the vaccine. Yes, um, yes, like the yes. point about force. I think if you want an example, you know, from from the left, I mean, I, I don't know. There are probably well, you know, there's been a lot of like protests. Um, so, 
what, what, like when, when you get like protests uh, for you know Black Lives Matter, and maybe there's a crowd police outside. Police have been attacked. Of, police have um, been attacked and killed as a consequence of those protests. So I think that um, yeah. you know, again, Mill would would be. Yeah, yeah. So, right. What I was trying to establish is that there's inconsistency. So, somebody who's left leaning, who supports the Black Lives Matter movement here, wouldn't be so ready to condemn the protesters that killed the police officers, or if rather they would, but they'd say, "Oh, but we didn't force them; we were just protesting." But yet, on the flip side, they want to blame Trump for the coup on the Capitol, where the exact same principle applies. Well, he didn't force them. He was just protesting something that he thought maybe he didn't, maybe he was lying. I don't know the mind of Trump. I don't even know if Trump knows the mind of Trump, but whatever the case it may be, in the exact same way that Trump didn't compel people to storm the Capitol, Black Lives Matter protesters didn't compel anyone to kill police officers. And yet people on the left might be very quick to vilify Trump for being integral in the motivation, but wouldn't be quick to vilify Black Lives Matter, despite being arguably integral in the motivation to attack a police officer. Do you see the kind of discontinuity I was trying to go for there? Yeah, I do. I, 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 also I, think I mixed that... it up in my head, but yeah, I, I think we're in really fertile territory here. And I think, I think this is a very, very important over and back. So this is, um, so I, I guess there's two points, right? So one point is, is you can, um, you can say, well, well, Mill is just being sort of too narrow in his, in his understanding of what harm is. But then, I mean, actually, I, I, I'm kind of glad you brought up this example of, uh, of of protests and, you know, some of the violence that happens at protests, because the sort of other side to this is to say, well, you know, actually, maybe maybe the harm principle is too strict, right, even in the way that Mill thought of it. I mean, do we want to say, like, let's say there's a protest of like a thousand people and, you know, some of them are going to be fired up, some of them are gonna, some of them are going to be angry. Um that happens at every protest. Actually, it'd be more than a thousand, wouldn't it? Some protests can get, you know, millions of people. OK, yeah. and then let's say, you know, uh, you know, two or three of the people in that protest end up, you know, smashing some windows or even killing somebody. Are we going to say that, um, you know, the entire protest is to be condemned or can be shut down? I find that kind of uh, like that's yeah. kind of horrifying. Because um, yeah. now you've just so, you, you've just that's a de facto ban on protest. That's the end of democratic right to assemble and um dissent yeah right there um, so uh, this is why you know this is why i'm not so quick <laughs> to cancel joe rogan because somebody might have died as a consequence of following his uh sea flu advice mm -hmm. yeah uh, because if you cancel him on the principle that he's a motivating factor well then you have to cancel movements because they can be motivating factors in debts. You have to cancel at least some specific voices, whatever specific um, Black Lives Matter proponent spoke at the rally might have spoken in very, and they often do, and you know, perhaps justifiably so, um, spoke, they might speak in very kind of vengeful uh, revolutionary language about standing up to our oppressors and all this kind of stuff. and. You know, fair enough. I mean, I'm an Irish person. I, 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 my history is replete, not my own personal history, I'm thankful to report, but the history of my people is replete with oppression um, from the British Empire. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could very easily be riled up by uh, a speech by an Irish nationalist talking about the, the evils of the monarchy and especially what recent stories about Prince Andrew and all of that madness that's going mm -hmm. on, right? I mean... <laughs> I don't know, like, should those speakers be held responsible if somebody in the crowd punches uh, the the colonizer, the, the imperialist's enemy, or in the case of Black Lives Matter, the police or whatnot? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some very uncomfortable <laughs> conclusions that could be derived if we go down this road, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think, I mean, well, I, I, I basically agree. I you know, I, I, I would I would worry that the harm principle um, is actually too strict. Um, yes. But, you know, so I guess there's, you know, I, I mean, I, I was originally like expressing, you know, challenges to Mill. And look, I mean, you know, there's there's an obvious sense. There's an obvious reason why we might endorse something like the harm principle. Right. And if we do, um, that's one way that we can push back against Mill's arguments. Um, so, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it's 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 sobering 
food for thought, Kane, I must admit, because the one thing, the reason I'm uncertain is because we can, to use Mill's own words, direct, we can we can draw a very direct line between the rhetoric of the Brett Weinsteins and the Joe Rogans of the world and some very real deaths. Mm. I would argue in no uncertain terms that at least in the case of, uh, I just want to make sure I get the name right, Leslie Lawrence, I believe, but let me double check. At least in the case of, yes, Leslie Lawrence, you can draw a direct line from him to Brett Weinstein. It's irrefutable. I would argue, again, in no uncertain terms, that Brett Weinstein bears responsibility. Not, maybe not the entire responsibility. I, I don't think you could make that case because at the end of the day, Leslie Lawrence was his own human, with his, you know, he, his own agent. You know, I don't believe in free will, but whatever decisions that that agent made or decisions that that agent carried out, they are embodied by that agent. And so, yeah, we have to take responsibility, whatever that means in a deterministic reality uh, for our own actions. I'm not saying we blame Brett Weinstein entirely, but I, I think you'd have to be really obtuse to not accept that Brett Weinstein has played a role of, of responsibility to one extent or another in that person's death. The question is, what do we do about it? It seems intrinsically obvious in one hand. Uh, oh, so clearly we just have to silence Brett Weinstein. We just have to actually stop his rhetoric. We have to, you know, get rid of all of this anti, you know, V nonsense. We have to silence it, get big government involved, shut it all down and um, close down those podcasts and um, cancel those people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe even arrest them and detain them and, and threaten them with legal sanctions if they say they're going to continue. But if you do all that, both the left and the right would have to swallow some pretty bitter pills. Because as you pointed out, Kane, speakers at rallies can incite violence, even though they might not have intended it. But you can draw a direct line between their pronouncements and the brutality that the mob can then <laughs> visit upon people in society as a consequence of hearing those words. Mm -hmm. And again, you can have that cognitive dissonance where a person on the left, and there are obviously examples on the right, I don't mean to crap on the left, I am left-leaning, they're my team here, so I feel like I can critique. Um, there are people on the left who would, on one hand, critique Trump for incitement, but then will not critique a left-leaning political movement for incitement in the exact same way and, and in the exact same manner. And I, I do think that there is a, a kind of cognitive dissonance going on there. Um, I'm just yeah, plugging, plugging uh, in something, by the way. I'm listening, but uh, my laptop's going to be dead. Yeah, so, uh, I, and I mean, like, again, my, my stance on this is is sort of, uh, like I, I, I'm really not, not sure. I do support a lot of, like, protests i think that's an important part of uh, society you know it's i agree an important part of history and uh yeah you know i i'm also not like of the opinion that you know they should never be kind of disruptive or you know like when when the to take the black lives matter example um when they that video came out of them burning down the police station i don't say i was like good for you guys you know like <laughs> and it, it seems like that it 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 required them to become that disruptive uh in order to you know get that guy arrested in order to get something done about what had happened um so you know one way to look at this is well like obviously burning down buildings should be against the law like obviously uh you've got to have a law against that sometimes maybe protests just have to break the law in order to you know make relevant changes so maybe we should have the harm principle right maybe we should sort of restrict speech in that way and you know then just accept like yeah actually sometimes we're going to have to break that principle you know sometimes the uh, uh, uh the end justifies the means there um, that said the elephant in the room here is that joe rogan statements <laughs> on the sea flu don't have the same <laughs> moral impetus no um, and and so when people die as a consequence or there is harm as a consequence, it's hard to to conjure a moral justification other than a fundamentalist commitment to free speech, which I think we've both agreed is a pretty toxic mm -hmm. idea. 
Right. Yeah. It's um, it's a tricky case. It is a tricky um, case. And so, again, I, I don't feel I've achieved any clarity here. And I think I'm, not, that I, I'm not saying that that was a goal, but I mean, it's a complicated and, as you say, tricky conversation. So I, I, I still don't know if I know what I think about this. I think it's worth adding as well, you know, um, in the case of the, the V, there is a further complication, which is, you know, we pointed out, well, you can sort of draw this line from um, the Leslie I think the name was uh, yeah. to to Brett Weinstein, right? Um, yeah. But you know, look, people have the sort of right to decide what to do with their own bodies. Um, you know, you can kind of make this argument that, that this like anti-paternalistic argument, where it's like, you know, even if I'm making a mistake, it's 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 my mistake. You know, it's my body, right? I can put into it or refuse to put into it whatever I want. Um, but the further complication here is is well. When we're talking about V's, right, this often affects other people. Um, so my failure to get a V may mean that I transmit a disease which kills someone else. Exactly and right. Now you have a now you have this further problem where it's like it's not just that I'm making a mistake with respect to myself. That yes. mistake is being spread to other people. Now, yeah. whether this argument still applies today, I'm not sure because the efficacy of the V against the new variant is is less right at least yeah. with respect to transmission I'm, i think it still does something but it's not i i think the consensus right. is still that it's better to be to have yeah. the v than not have the v but yes it, the its efficacy is reduced um so that's my understanding as well i mean yes. it certainly prevents severe disease and death right yes. there's no question yes. about that it's but yeah. the transmission I, I think it's much, much less effective, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, so this point about, well, you know, it's putting other people in a dangerous position maybe doesn't apply so strongly here. But look, I mean, hopefully they're going to come out with new Vs. And when yeah. they do that, maybe they'll prevent transmission. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's just a sort of further wrinkle to this. Um, where yeah, it's, and it's very wrinkly indeed. <laughs> If the listeners' heads are exploding at this point, please understand that mine is as well, because there's so much on the table now that, again, I've retreated back into a position of agnosticism. What I mean by that is I'm not saying I'm agnostic on my free speech principle generally. I think we should err on the side of free speech um, unless there's an incredibly obvious reason not to. The question is whether or not the Joe Rogan situation serves as an example of a case where it's incredibly obvious that we should not err on the side of free speech. But as we've just discussed over the last half an hour in this portion of the conversation, if we want to uh, censor Joe Rogan or cancel him or remove his podcast or something like that, because we can draw a direct line between his murmurings and um, harm or the same with Brett Weinstein, for example, again, you then have to start drawing lines of harm from people's positions to all sorts of things and then suddenly we end up living in a very 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 unfree society altogether right and i don't think it, it would be any surprise that it's mostly people on the left who are criticizing joe rogan on this front mm -hmm. and those very same people on the left again they wouldn't like if this principle were applied unilaterally this idea that if any speech of yours is traceable to harm um Jesus, I mean, uh, how much of our speech would end up being silenced as a consequence of following that principle, right? Um, There's a, I, I can't remember scary. exactly where this case happened, but I know that there was, a, I think it might have been somewhere like Texas. Um, well, I, I mean, well, it's, there's lots of cases like this, actually. So it, it really, you know, it, you know, you can pick and choose. But uh, um, it was like an expansion of the uh, terrorism legislation. Um, which was like being kind of applauded by part of the left because you know it's being applied against white supremacists. What it had to do with was it had to do with you know, if you have a terrorist organization and then you know you have like other groups that are sort of associated with it, you could prosecute those other groups by this. It was that kind of thing. Like a but I just remember case. sort of having this like horrifying. You know, I had this image of all of those environmentalist protesters who had you know, committed some sort of property damage. But because of these obscenely expansive um, terrorist laws, they count as terrorists. Like, you know, you yeah. go and, you know, damage a tractor or something and, you know, well, that makes you a terrorist, right? Um, like these 
these sort of say the fact of the matter is like we can debate the um the sort of philosophical principle of this stuff but in practice right any law that you institute or, or not even a law but like any sort of social convention that you allow companies like spotify say to put into place um it's going to be used against radical movements in general it just yeah. will be that's what always happens um yes and, it, and this isn't i mean you know this isn't a slippery slope argument it's this is already happening right? yeah. it's so, an observational right. position <laughs> yeah so it's just worth bearing that in mind right yes. like yes yeah are there any final comments from Mill that we need to address? Because I know Mill has a kind of a quasi fourth and fifth kind of position that we could um, articulate here, right? Um, yeah. Hear about meaning is lost without challenge and silencing an opinion won't make it go away. I think these are the final two threads that we need to address before we wrap up here, Kane. Shall we take them in order? OK, yeah. So, I mean, I think the fourth point is kind of an elaboration in some ways of the third. Where, I agree. So, you know, the point of the third was is that if you don't allow your opponent to speak, you will lose the ability to justify your own position. Um, yes. And then the point of the fourth is that you'll actually you will not even understand what your position is. Um, yes. Like if you do not encounter sincere opposition, um, it like you just won't really know what it is you're saying. So maybe one way to sort of think about this is imagine if you spent your whole life like looking at the world through red tinted glasses and yes. so like everything's red well you wouldn't really understand what redness was right the only way you can understand what red is is by contrasting it things which aren't red so yeah. you know when people are in this position where they just end up sort of parroting popular slogans they often don't really even understand what they're saying um uh you know like one of the things that you get when you look at uh like the history of of kind of philosophical dialogue right one of the things that we we, tr we often try to do is we engage people in dialogue and then we reveal hidden inconsistencies in their position that maybe they, they didn't realize. Um, you know, we reveal incoherencies like you thought you had a position which was perfectly consistent and coherent, but oh, it actually turns out it isn't, you know, and, and that happens through, you know, bringing the position into conflict with other positions. So, um, yeah, I, I say it's kind of an elaboration of the third point, but, um, you know, maybe is uh worth stating separately yeah so it, yeah meaning is lost without challenge i love the red glasses example uh my question i've written here is but would we really misunderstand the importance or meaning of v's without v deniers like do we really need v deniers in order to value v's like do, do we really yeah. do we really need them does this point actually hold because the idea here is that universally accepted truths can be good, but the drawback is that we lose the ability to defend yeah. the truth, right? But my, again, my question is, well, it's a two-part question, really. One is, would we really lose our sense of value for Vs in the absence of anti -Vers? Um, And in addition to that, even if it were the case <clears throat> that we lost some kind of an ability to defend the, the value of Vs, wouldn't that be a price worth paying if we could save all of those who died as a consequence of swallowing the anti-V rhetoric hook, line and sinker? Yeah, so I think the price worth paying point is is, is pretty powerful here, right? Like, as, as yes. I mentioned, you know, Mill is, he's pointing out that there are certain values that are lost when we suppress speech, but there are other values as well. And, yeah. you know, I think you can maybe, like maybe Mill was just, sort of too optimistic about like the idea that you know allowing all opinions to be expressed will you know allow us to, to find the truth and you know that's going to bring instrumental benefit like you know humans are just sort of very flawed and maybe that's not the case um so that's that's a problem i think on the point about losing the meaning of it though it might be sort of hard to it's it's hard to think about this because of course we're in a position where we do have anti value right? So of course we understand the meaning because it's not a dogma to us. But it might be worth contrasting it to something that generally does go unchallenged. Like if you think about uh, certain fundamental values like 
freedom or democracy, right? Well, what like what are they? Like what exactly what what exactly is you know uh, freedom, for instance? And you know, like what does that even mean? I mean, I see what you mean. When you when you start like thinking about that, you know, everybody just kind of assumes that it's this like good thing, right? But when you start thinking about it, it it can be kind of difficult to explain. You know, not just what's good about it, but what it even is. And so a good example of this would be if you talk to sort of the uh, US style libertarians, um, you know, their conception of freedom is, you know, very much focused on like property rights and a person's right over their property. Right. So yeah. if you own a field, right, like I decide what goes in that field, it's my field. And it would be violating my freedom if somebody was to come and stand on the field. Right. And that's just kind of taken for granted in in, you know, the, the sort of US libertarian scene. And now, I can shoot to, you if you don't leave. Right. Now, if you were to go and express that to someone who lives in Scotland, they'd be like, you know, what the hell? That's not freedom. Right. We have a right to roam. You know, if you if you prevent me from walking across your if I'm just like out for a walk and I want to walk across your field, I'm going to walk across your field. That's my, that's my liberty. You know, that's that's what freedom is. Right. What, what you're using, you know, you're going to use the like power of the state to enforce your property rights and stop me from walking across your field. Are you kidding? You know, so. Yeah. yeah. Very okay. different conceptions, which is right. So but I think that a lot of people just sort of they just don't think about this. Right. And so that might be an example of where perhaps because it's something that's like never really challenged, the very meaning of it is 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 lost. So I think that that, that does have some you know application. How it would apply to the case of, of the V's is, again, it's less obvious because we live in a society where there are, you know, anti and it's, it's not a you know, it's not a dead dogma, as Mill said. Yeah, but maybe. <laughs> Uh, maybe it serves a role, and again, I'm not saying I really believe this, but I'm just, you know, putting out a hypothetical. Maybe the rhetoric of people like Weinstein and Rogan serves a role in exactly the way that you described. We are being challenged in our um, the dominant position, the consensus, the scientific consensus on the matter is that V's are effective and <clears throat> and a, a good idea, and for the greater good and all of that. So one could argue, perhaps, although I don't know how persuasive it is, that people who say things like Weinstein and Rogan do are actually serving an incredibly important purpose in that we, by hearing that rhetoric and having to respond to it, are continuously reminded, or at least frequently reminded, if not infrequently reminded, uh, of um, the pro-V position and how to defend it. Um, and why it matters, because maybe, maybe the death of someone like Anesley uh, or Leslie, I keep bloody forgetting the name. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I want to get it right. So Leslie Lawrence and maybe the death of a, of a Leslie Lawrence actually serves as a sobering reminder of the importance. And now I know that's a pretty, I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm actually championing that argument, because that is, if you translate it, something like maybe this person had to die to remind the rest of us of why we need to do this. Mm. Um, I would rather that didn't happen. Yeah. And I would rather there was another way of persuading people. But if you want to try and have a glass half full approach to this, maybe, just maybe, it's possible to articulate the idea that this death doesn't, hasn't occurred without um, some kind of silver lining. Um Again, I don't think this is necessarily the most persuasive argument, but it's something worth considering. I suppose the uh, the sad thing is, is that all of the uh, deaths of the anti V people that don't, don't, that doesn't seem to have had much of an influence. Uh, no, <laughs> so, no, no, because each new story is considered to be a, a conspiracy <laughs> of its own. Um, that this person isn't really dead. They're now in a secret room somewhere paid off by the CIA. I mean, the conspiracy theorists on 9-11, goodness gracious me, the things they came out with, um, that all those families have just been shuttled off and they are uh, they were either killed by the government so that they wouldn't speak or they were paid off and given new identities, witness protection, that kind of nonsense. You see, this is the problem. Conspiracy theories are curtailed only by the extent of one's creativity. 
and people can be remarkably creative. The absence of evidence can be infinitely reinterpreted as interpreted as evidence for the proposition. Oh, there's no evidence because they got rid of the evidence. Oh, well, the problem with that is, is that that's indistinguishable from there being no evidence, in which case it might not be true, you know. Um, so, yeah, leave it to the conspiracy theorists. But uh, moving then to the final argument, Kane. Uh, yes, yeah, so the final, <laughs> the final million point, um, the fifth one, which uh, I think is actually this is just before you address it. By the way, I had been using this argument to defend free speech for decades, and I didn't mm-hmm. realize that I was actually championing Mill when I did it, when I was doing it. So I, I kind of intuited this point all on my own. I'm not saying that to toot my own horn or anything. I think a lot of people will have probably thought of this independently, but um, I was quite. Uh, I was quite overjoyed <laughs> to discover that it was actually a million point. Um, so it was please, probably, uh, please yeah, it was probably in the air before Mill as well. I mean, oh, no know, doubt, so. no doubt. Yeah. yeah, it's not like um, he's the progenitor of the idea, but um, certainly a popularizer of the idea. So yeah, another a final point he makes is well, you know, when you silence these opinions, that's not actually going to make them go away. Yeah. Um, so people are still going to hold those views. Um, they may not be able to express them. And there's, there's a couple of problems with this. So it's going to hold them secretly. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the first thing is, is that you deprive yourself of the knowledge of uh, of other people. Right. So yes. you deprive yourself of the ability to understand other people's behavior. Um, and I mean, this is something which is not like this isn't just hypothetical, because if you look at things like election polling and stuff, um, you often get this problem of certain of support for certain parties just being systematically underestimated. I think the support for Trump was systematically underestimated. Um, because people, when they were well asked, be, yeah, when they were may, asked didn't, didn't tell the truth about who they were going to yeah. vote for. Right. Yeah. So it may well be due to self-censorship because of worries yeah. about you know, social standing. So one of the problems with with censorship then is that you're actually depriving yourself of knowledge. Right. You're you're removing your ability to get information about the world. Um, and then the, the other thing that is a problem, the, the other problem with this is that you deprive the people that you are censoring of the ability to change their minds, because if they're not even expressing their views, then obviously they're not really going to encounter the best arguments against their views. I mean, yep. you know, they're, well, they're just not even saying them, right? So nobody's going to be presenting arguments against them. They might well encounter sort of dogmatic assertions of slogans you know but they're not actually going to encounter robust arguments that might change their mind um so yeah so there's this sort of twin problem where it's like what you end up with is a situation where you do not understand what's going on like what other people are doing and why and then those other people do not have the opportunity to sort of exchange their error for for um for truth um Yes. So yeah, that's that's basically that's basically the uh, the problem there. Um, final problem. Yeah, and the question I wrote here, and I think I've just answered it myself, but uh, it'd be interesting. I'll give you, I'll read the question and give you my thoughts, and then, and then you can tell me whether or not you agree. The question I wrote down here about Mill's fifth uh, defense is, but wouldn't silencing a view long term, like I'm talking about, you know, a silent make it illegal and silence it over a century. Mm. If you silence a view long term, wouldn't that eventually or at least potentially lead to the eradication of that idea? I mean, like Greek civilization died out. People don't mm-hmm. believe in the Greek gods anymore, right? Yeah. Um and and that would happen albeit through an immense amount of stately force, but then the natural process of death would take place and eventually enough of people will have died who believed that thing secretly um in order to protect themselves that the idea won't have been passed on it won't have been spread it won't have proliferated it will die like a youtube video dies if it doesn't catch the algorithm right yeah if if an idea doesn't catch the algorithm the societal algorithm and doesn't get passed like ideas do and doesn't catch on well then won't it eventually be eradicated uh, my answer to this question that i've just realized is yes that's possible and so silencing an opinion could in fact make it go away but this would just cause mills first criticism to reoccur because there's always a chance that you're suppressing the correct opinion so you've silenced and eradicated the truth in potentially 
right? Yeah, that's that's one problem, and I I think that um, I or think a kernel was, or a kernel of the yeah. truth, because maybe it was partially <laughs> correct to to bring back the second point. So I think right. the other thing that you, that is worth bearing in mind here is that when we, you know, like these values don't like exist just sort of in the abstract or just like alone, right? It's not just that we want free speech. I mean, we have free speech as part of, you know, a liberal democracy, right? And so certainly, you know, I think that democracy is a worthwhile value. Now, fine, right? You may well be able to completely suppress an opinion if you have a totalitarian state, right? And, you know, you just like, you really come down hard and, you know, you're like refusing to allow people to even hear of this opinion. And it's, uh, 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 and, you know, well, you know what I mean? Like if it's a sort of, uh, yeah, totalitarian state system, then that maybe will give you the ability to control the population in such a way that you really can just shut it down. And yeah. then over the long term, you know, over decades as people die off, that's it, the opinion's gone. Um, I don't know how effective that sort of thing is. Um, like I'm not, I, I, I just, ha I, I don't know. I haven't like looked throughout history. I'm sure there are examples of it happening. Um, I, th I think that probably most social change is more kind of organic. I mean, I'm not sure like I'll what give happened. you a good example if you want one. Oh, okay, go ahead. The yeah. Irish language. The Irish language was wiped out by the British. Okay. Now, it's not, I, I won't say it wiped out because it still exists, albeit in rudimentary form. Yeah. Van a vanishingly small number of people in Ireland still speak Irish. It is a dying language. It will not survive. It, it Through the enormous, and I dare say amazing and patriotic efforts of certain Irish people and um, Radio Telefiche Aaron, um, which is a um, television um, station in Ireland and another one TG Cahar um, these are Irish television stations and radio stations through their enormous and amazing efforts of, of preservation and education in the Irish education system where they keep teaching Irish as a language um, they've managed to keep it you know keep it there by a thread mm -hmm. but the Irish language was pretty successfully wiped out by the British they made it illegal to express ideas in Irish and they killed anyone who dissented and spoke in Irish. And so okay, they, yeah. very, they very, very quickly annihilated Irish. And so there's an example of a, of a, a near 99% successful eradication. 99% isn't the actual number, just to be clear. I'm just trying to impress upon the listener the, uh, the overwhelming tot total success or the totality of the success of the British in eradicating the Irish language. So it can work. Yeah, actually, I mean, now that you've said that, it occurs to me that this is probably pretty common throughout history. Um, yes. So, yes. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, but of course, um, we don't we don't want that. We don't want the government to be doing no. that. Right. We want to live in, in democracy. And so the, the problem with taking this sort of long term view of, well, you know, we can suppress the opinion and right then like over over the decades, maybe it will just disappear. Um, I mean, we can't think decades ahead. You've got to think four or five years ahead to the next election, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And then, um, and like, that's the problem. The, the, I think we end up with this kind of problem of, um, it's like a, a, a sort of sort of dog whistle problem, right? So whenever it comes to suppressing an opinion, I mean, there's sort of two ways you can go about it. You can have really specific rules Right. Which say, you know, you're not allowed to say this thing in these circumstances. When you have that, that doesn't really prevent the expression of the idea. I mean, it might prevent people from exploring the idea. It might prevent them from going into arguments, but it doesn't really prevent it because people can dog whistle. Um, yes. I mean, like racism is OK. It's not really socially acceptable to just come out and express like outright racism. Right. But there's a hell of a lot you can do in terms of just dog whistling. Um, so so that's that doesn't really prevent it. The way to prevent it is to take a much more like extreme approach and, you know, maybe like a sort of, well, I know it when I see it and just leave it up to, um, you know, leave it up to sort of judges to kind of make their own decision and but be like really strict. You know, if it yeah. seems like it might just be racist, shut it down. Um, and that comes to the whole host point, of its own problems of brutality and authoritarianism. Yeah. At that point, you know, you you have, again, like this totalitarian system. And bear in yeah. mind, if you choose that option, right, then it is going to um, 
it is going to be used against primarily, you know, the poor, right? It's people yep. who are going to be unable to defend themselves in courts. You, yeah, what you are doing when you choose that totalitarian option is you're saying, yeah, you know, I want the police to be, you know, breaking into people's houses and, you know, taking their computers because maybe they said something a bit dodgy on Twitter. I want them to lose their jobs. I want them to, you know, be getting like beaten up, right? I get like by the police force, caught up in courts for years, imprisoned. Um, so, you know, I can see why uh, a left leaning person would be tempted, right, to have like strict laws against racism. But I, I think yeah. it's um, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. With oh, absolutely. Sort of I was just going to say, I mean, <laughs> the left leaning person who is articulating these ideas and, and thinks them desirable really isn't thinking far enough ahead, because if you want to have a society where a government that's in control has these powers and these abilities, that's going to blow back in your face at some point, right? There will be a left-wing idea that um, given enough time will become um, ascendant in our idea of what is toxic and disgusting and unacceptable. I, for example, I envisage a future where we're going to look back at identity politics and think, Jesus Christ above, what were we doing? You know, when somebody looks at me and says, you're a white male, so you don't belong in a conversation about racism. Your opinion doesn't matter. Or you have a penis, so don't you dare utter anything about abortion. I have a feeling, and these people fancy themselves as progressives. I have a feeling that we will look back in the history books in years to come and we will look at all of this stuff that's happening right now as the kind of Douglas Murray has made this point. He's a conservative commentator who I don't agree with on most things, but I think he's right on this. He said, we'll look back at all of this stuff as the post Holocaust era <laughs> where there was a massive over adjustment and over correction where we went obviously to the brutality and the extremis of the 20th century and the gulag and the Holocaust and all the rest of it. But then coming out of that, when we were correcting ourselves, we went too far the other way where there was, you know, quotas in jobs where the best person for the job didn't get it because they were white in this particular example. And instead we gave it to an ethnic minority who might have been in this particular example inept, but we give it to them because of their skin color rather than basing it on merit, right? Now that's not, I said twice there in this example, that's not me at all articulating the idea that white people have more merit than others. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in this specific hypothetical, if a person was given the job because of their skin color as opposed to their merit because of an overcorrection and a quota requirement in a company, I have a feeling we're going to look back on those policies which are happening right now and we're going to think, oh my God, we were insane, right? And when that happens, the left-leaning types of the future may very well fall victim to the very same authoritarian intrusions that they're praying for in the case of a Joe Rogan. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't actually even have to look at the future. We can just look at, you know, the UK government's uh, recent policies on protesting, which are definitely going to be targeting yeah. uh, environmentalist movements. <laughs> yeah. right? like, it's not even the future, it's happening now. It's <laughs> happening right now, which is why we need to be super cautious. So, guys, in summary, then, going back through Mill's five arguments, I'm going to do just a quick bullet fire. I just want to capture the Joe Rogan conversation and five bullet points. And Kane, if you want to add anything, please jump in. <clears throat> so Mill's first argument, there's always a chance that the suppressed opinion is correct. I think Kane and I both agree that it's quite unlikely that Rogan is correct in his anti-V comments. Um, but maybe because of the corruption that exists in scientific institutions, it's possible that he's more correct than we realized. Fair enough, Kane. Yeah, there's there's a possibility there at the very least. Mm -hmm. Remember, all I'm resisting here is the idea that he should be shut down or that he, what he's doing should be rendered illegal. Number two, um, Mill says in most debates, neither side is entirely correct. I think this is evidently the case with Rogan when he articulated these concerns about psychology and the effect of long term lockdowns. Agreed, Kane. Yep. Um, and there was much more that we could have talked about there. Of course, we talked about an immense amount on each one of these points. The third one, even if the view is totally false, it should be heard so that others who are correct are challenged. I think that holds here, doesn't it? 
even if Rogan is wrong, and he appears to be wrong on a number of fronts here, like Weinstein, Wein, Weinstein is, um, even if they're wrong, and they are, in my view, um, given this, what the scientific consensus says, they still serve as a useful launch pad for conversations like this one, even. Mm -hmm. Right, even conversations like this one. Do you have anything to add there, Kim? Um, I mean, nothing more than I, I guess I already said. You know, I, I think, yeah, I uh, like... I think certainly there is a a, a value um, to uh, the expression of these ideas. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't weigh it against other values. But I think there is a value that is lost when those ideas are suppressed. Sure. And you're referring there, of course, to the value of human life. And right. if, if lives are lost, there may be situations where we might have to consider, you know, you articulated the scenario earlier where if we were talking about the bubonic plague, <laughs> if we were talking about the Black Death, and Joe Rogan was on his podcast recommending people to not get a V that we had invented for it. And we were 50% of the population were dying. Maybe then, but I, I don't know. Some people might say we were already there with, with the C flu because 150,000 reported deaths occurred here in the UK. Now, mm -hmm. conspiracy theorists want to talk about how those numbers were massaged. Do you know what I do in those conversations? I grant straight off the bat, okay, let's pretend for the sake of this conversation that the numbers are off by 50%. So 75,000 people died. Are you okay with that number? Now, that's a massive olive branch to extend. But even if you half the number in the presence of these people who want to say that the numbers were massaged, halving the number is obviously obscene. But I'm happy to half the number. And we still have a crisis. 75,000 is nothing to, to like, hand wave away, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, look, uh, uh, this is the point, as I've already said, this is the point that I'm the most uncertain about, Kane. I get the sense that you're pretty uncertain about this as well. Would it be fair to say that you're unsure about whether or not the value of free speech should win out over the value of human life? Is that a fair statement about you? That's what I'm detecting. <clears throat> I'm I'm un unsure of the justification. I mean, let's put it that way. My my inclination is is pretty firmly in the free speech direction, right? Sure. But sure. I, you know, if you ask me to justify it, I don't I don't think it's easy at all. And no, so I'm no. you know, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure in that respect. Yeah, my inclinations are definitely in the direction of free speech as well. I agree with Alex O'Connor, cosmic skeptic, probably one of the most successful YouTubers uh, in the world with a philosophy channel, at least. I agree with his uh, phrasing in this. When he was interviewed on this question, he said that free speech needs to be the default and any or all attempts to limit it need to be carefully and extremely cautiously considered. Yeah. And... I agree with that. These people who are just ready to kind of willingly just give up our freedoms, just no, nope, no nope, freedom of speech gone. When I say our freedoms, I'm clearly not talking about the UK because we evidently don't even have it, Kane. Um, <laughs> Section five of the Public Order Act, give me a break. Um, but number four then, meaning is lost without challenge. I'm not so sure how relevant this is, albeit I do agree with the idea that it would become difficult to understand the importance of Vs in the absence of anti Vers, right? Um, Anything to add there, Kim? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I think that's, yeah, again, pretty much covered, covered yep. it when we talked about it. Sure. And last but not least, then, five, silence in an opinion won't make a go away unless you're willing to I impose upon a people a brutal, harsh, authoritarian regime. Mm. This point holds. Silencing an opinion doesn't make it go away. It just encourages people into a culture of silence. And then they go to the voting booth and they cast the vote in favor of their real, true, internal ideas anyway. Ideas that might well have been moderated had they been exposed to challenge in a free market of ideas. Would you agree with that, Kane? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I again, you know, like these sort of general claims about how society works, it's it's hard to be sure. You know, it is. No, like, I agree. I, I hope I'm not coming across but, uh, as, as too certain you know, here. That's that's pretty much I think that's where my stance is at, at the moment. Yeah, I think that if you want to have a democracy and I certainly do, you know, I want, you know, I, I like that idea. Right. I like the idea of resisting hierarchy and, you know, bringing power to individual people and like letting individual lives flourish and allowing them to, you know, come to decisions as a community in a sort of democratic way. In that context, 
it seems to me that there really is an important role being played by free speech in that it allows us to understand, you know, what other people think. And in any case, as I I mentioned, like when it comes to suppressing these ideas, it's like, well, you know, if you if you just have like really, really precise laws, then you just get dog whistling and you don't actually prevent the the spread of those ideas. Um, The only way to do it, I think it seems like the only way to do it is just really harsh, brutal authoritarianism. Um, And we don't want that. No, (laughs) that's been tried. And there's a, a body count that uh beggar's belief but you know i could be wrong so <laughs> <laughs> and you know what kane i cannot actually do you know what i cannot think of a better place to finish the conversation than with that statement and let me join in i could be wrong on this i could be absolutely wrong on this but you know what if i'm wrong on this the only way i'm going to discover that <laughs> is if i can have a free conversation with people who disagree with me right Right, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it, really. Kane, do you have any final thoughts? Because we've been, it's coming up in three hours, if I'm not mistaken. This has been a long conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. But I do want to give you an opportunity in closing um, to add anything else that you consider to be pertinent. But if not, um, that's cool, too. I think I said what I wanted to say. I'm actually, it went, it went, I was a little bit worried about this conversation precisely because I, I, I don't have, you know, like such a clear position and I'm not sure about the justifications. And I was sort of thinking, like, oh, you know, am I am I going to know what to say? But uh, no, I, I really enjoyed this. So thanks for, you know, having me ha- having me on. OK, that that warms my heart. I tell you, I um I I <laughs> I don't want to gush here or anything, but uh, I, I've said this to you off air and I've said it to you a message more times than you care to read probably, but I, I'm, it's just, I, I see myself as such a small fry in this whole YouTube game. And I am objectively speaking. Uh, my channel is very, very small. And I told you the story of the time I first reached out to you. I just messaged you randomly because I had been a long ter- a long ter- um, a long term fan of your <clears throat> channel and i just messaged you one day and said i'd I'd love i'd absolutely love to have a chat with you about uh morality and ethics and so on and meta ethics and you just got back to me and said yes and now you've said yes for the second time and i'll just echo your sentiment um my friend i hope it's okay for me to call you my my friend uh uh, i um i um i i'm really enjoying um these conversations that we're having i'm hoping this second one isn't the last one we have uh, it's an honor to share the stage with you my friend and it's uh if the audience gets something out of it as well well isn't that just a greasy bonus so <laughs> thank you very very much for joining me here again today it, it really has been a joy i have to say i'm uh, i'm beaming here i i could keep going for another three hours that's the problem but i don't know if an audience is going to watch a six-hour conversation <laughs> I'm getting the sense that your enthusiasm for these conversations is never ending as well, Kane. Oh yeah, I mean I love talking about this stuff. Uh, yeah. So you know, if you ever <laughs> you wouldn't have you wouldn't have done a PhD in it <laughs> if you did. If you ever want to do a, another uh, conversation, then yeah, just just let me know. Um, yeah, that would be an honor, Kane. That would be an honor. I will absolutely, absolutely take you up on that offer, assuming that we are free to do so (laughs) and the free speech laws don't become even more restrictive between now and then who knows russia might bomb us out of existence i don't know if you've been keeping tabs of the russia ukraine situation but oh yeah that's um that's horrifying it sort of makes all of this feel remarkably trivial doesn't it it? does doesn't it it that's does. happening as I mean I don't know when you're going to put this up, but like we're speaking on the 24th of February, so yes. just so people have a sense of just how trivial this all seems, yeah. um, you know, compared to what's happening in Ukraine. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I read this on Twitter, and this this is actually not, not a bad place to to close. I know I've I've said we close earlier, but this is this is not a bad point to finish on, and I think it's something that you'll agree with me on. Looking at what's going on in Russia right now is a sobering reminder about how valuable a society we have, about how how appreciative we should be about the freedoms that we actually have. Because I complain about Section 5 of the Public Order Act quite a lot, and I see it as oppressive and unpleasant and restrictive. But 
at the end of the day, I can make this YouTube video and with a little bit of, you know, just being polite and careful and a little bit of clever editing and mm. editing out a few swears, I can more or less say whatever I want to say. And I think you can as well. You've been doing it for years, much longer than I have on on your YouTube channel, right? And so I think what's going on in Russia is a nice reminder. You know, I don't, I don't mean to say, oh, because they're suffering, look at how great our lives are. But I really do mean to say that when you see the suffering that goes on elsewhere in the world, it is a very useful reminder of all that we should be grateful for in our little country here of England, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are plenty of uh, problems, um, but at the end of the day, this is probably one of the best societies to live in in the world and throughout most of the history of human civilization. Um, I agree with that. Probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. I agree um, with that. And I agree and I with that, that um, as an Irishman. I agree with that as an Irishman. That's as, right, as, yeah. As a, as a person who was a, a previous victim of this country's history. Yeah. Uh, not personally, but my ancestors, right? And I've been made feel welcome with open arms in this country. I think right? that, you know, the sort of, freedoms that we do have and the degree of sort of tolerance that we have um, is really unusual. Like it's really yeah. remarkable. Um, yeah. So that's something worth preserving. And it might, what we might be discovering is that not only is it unusual, but rare. Mm. I mean, if you look at the global stage and so, yeah, you know what, Kane, that's a wonderful place to leave it. Let's, let's be grateful for for what we have and I for one am extremely grateful to have had another amazing conversation with you and I can only hope that the listeners enjoyed it as well probably the longest episode of a magician's thoughts I've ever done but yeah maybe it'll be the first of many long episodes we shall see guys if you enjoyed the conversation you know the deal drop a like uh, it would be amazingly helpful if you did that and if it is your first time visiting the channel you're probably not still watching <laughs> <laughs> but if you did through some miracle get this far in the conversation do consider hitting that subscribe button and while you're at it don't forget to check the bell notification icon because that way you will be notified as and when my latest videos go live I couldn't recommend more highly as well in closing that you check out Kane's channel Kane is amazing I have learned an immense amount in, in many of my videos, in fact. If Kane has made a video touching a similar topic, I'll watch Kane's video first. I've learned an, an immense amount from Kane. I'm not surprised to hear, Kane, that teachers have in the past referred their students to your content because it's just, it's awesome. It's a, it's a, it's a PhD of its own to just go through your content. You could learn an enormous amount. And I just want to recommend the listeners to do that. Um, and uh, they won't, you will not regret it, dear listener. Other than that, guys, thank you very much for watching this video. And uh, thank you again, Kane, for joining me. And I hope to see you again, Kane, in the future. And to you, dear listener, I hope to see you in the next one. All the best. Bye-bye. Okay.